the uh, killing of seven aid workers in the Gaza Strip with World Central Kitchen, the charity. We're now hearing uh, from Cyprus that the aid ships that have been travelling from Cyprus into Gaza, uh, of course this was a big development for those in Gaza that the aid was able to come in that way. Uh, aid ships are now being turned around, still carrying aid. Uh, 240 tonnes of undelivered aid is now heading back to Cyprus because of this uh, attack on a car killing seven aid workers because the charity obviously unloading the ship and distributing that aid in Gaza World Central Kitchen, one of those charities involved, has now suspended its operations because of this apparent Israeli airstrike. We'll bring you more. <laughs> Welcome, 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 everybody. Left Reckoning 163. My name is David Griscom, and I'm broadcasting to you live, bringing in right now my good friend Matt Leck, co host of the program. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing okay, David. Good to be with you, though. Yeah, I mean, a little bit of a, of a wild ride here. I mean, we are going to be watching in just a second um, some of the most egregious uh, and, uh, you know, brutal cover-ups for, uh, you know, the continued slaughter of Palestinians um, by Israel. Um, you know, and there's just an aspect to it where, you know, it's it, it, it becomes sort of laughable to a certain extent, right? Because it just is so egregious and so in your face. Um, but yes, it is absolutely uh, devastating, uh, you know, the context here. Yeah, just to decode that, <clears throat> some of the things in that news piece there, which I think conveyed some of the horror, but just a few things. When they say aid, they mean food and water. Mm -hmm. uh, World Central Kitchen, yeah, that's food. These people are starving to death. Um, uh, and apparent Israeli airstrike, it was three. It was mm -hmm. three strikes, three different times, at three different locations of the same convoy of uh, people. Uh, and yeah, so um, yeah, the I think, you know, I guess what's what's wild is, trying to convey the actual sort of abject evil that we are seeing now. And, you know, we have our spokespeople just barely, barely getting over the line in trying to launder it into something uh, acceptable. You know, and again, like people make this point a lot on, on, on the love, but it's like, you know, that kind of passive voice here in, in that uh, news clip we just played, um, you know, where it's like, oh, some folks were killed. Well, killed by who? Um, you know, and it's like at, at a certain point, um, you know, there isn't, a refusal there's been a refusal for a long time to sort of acknowledge what's going on in the first place um and now it's just is so in your face it's undeniable um there's just a lot of attempts to kind of divert um blame or muddy the water i mean this has been from the get-go uh, from early um israel airstrikes into gaza um to something like this uh, which again let's not forget um you know the recent news the recent images of what happened at that hospital um, you know, just an unbelievable rampage of, of violence, hatred, and inhumanity um, committed by Israel um, against the Palestinian people. Um, but this is just, I think, uh, you know, a, a very clear example of just how brazen uh, Israel has been, uh, continues to be, and the refusal uh, from the Americans, from the American government at least, uh, to acknowledge what is going on. So just, you know, maybe just to, to, to set the table a little bit for folks um, who are, are unfamiliar, who don't have the complete story, um, what happened here um, is an organization set up uh, by celebrity chef uh, Jose Andreas that we'll get to um, in a second, the connections there to D.C., um, was doing the human work of providing food uh, for Palestinian people um, who, continued, uh, who continued to face an onslaught of genocide, um, attempts to starve them out. Um, and if that's not enough, uh, bombs constantly uh, being dropped on them along with brutality from foot soldiers in the IDF. Now, um, these uh, food trucks, um, th these trucks delivering food, went in um, to a predetermined location that had been approved by the IDF, right? So this is not something where people were sort of operating under their own, um, you know, uh, uh, un un under their own organization. No. They go to the IDF, they say, hey, we have food that we're going to deliver to the starving people. We're going to go to this location. We're going to take this route. We're going to be here from this time to that time. And then we're going to come back. These aid workers followed that to the letter. 
um, what it, it was that they told the IDF that they were going to be doing along the route that the IDF told them to take, right? There's not a mistake. Oh, we took a scenic route or we took a right when we shouldn't have. This group of people were on the path that had already been approved by the IDF. The IDF knew who they were. They knew where they were. Um, and they knew what time they were supposed to be at the places that they were, right? So, you know, any kind of thing of like, oh, maybe they got confused about this or that. They had the information about where this group was. So on the return journey, after they had uh, delivered this food, the IDF, um, they they were, this, this group of people were bombed. Um, not once, not twice, uh, but three times. And there's been some images that have come out uh, since I don't want to, you know, over um, overdo it uh, with some of these gruesome images, but just to sort of, um, you know, make clear to folks what we're talking about, the scale of damage here. Um, here is an image of one of these trucks. Um, as you can see here very clearly, a massive crater at the top of it. Um, that happened not again, not once, not twice, but three times. Um, and the, despite all all of this destruction, there's something that should be noted that's very, very clear here, is that on top of all of these trucks, absolutely clear, undeniable, even with all of this damage, there is the symbol of um, the world uh, kitchen um, <clears throat> here uh, that is you know set up so that Israel did not do. Uh, yeah, why thing. did that have to be there? Why yeah. did they have to put that on top? And uh, it didn't matter. They're, they're, I mean, clearly the reason they put on is what everybody knows, which is that Israel will bomb this bomb, take any excuse to bomb a vehicle. And yet, doesn't matter. They did it anyway and hit it right on the money. Yeah. Because oh, it was a precision they know, strike. They don't care exactly. <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, to to point that out. I mean, like that. This is target acquired, right? you know think about the video there it's like boom zoomed in here's where exactly where it's going and that's where it went so yeah this is not shrapnel uh this is not uh, uh you know fallout or anything like that this was a deliberate strike here now um i mean we can uh we we know why israel uh did it uh we'll we'll play some clips from the united states government in a second but let's just note two re real quick things as, as we're setting the table here What's the reaction? Um, rightfully, people are furious about it. Um, but what's the secondary reaction been? Well, Jose Andres, out of fear for the safety of these people who are putting themselves in harm's way, um, has said that they're going to suspend operations um, in the area. Um, and on top of that, a whole host of other charity organizations, food organizations, groups that are trying to deliver aid uh, to the people of Gaza um, have said that they're going to suspend operations. Um, so... Uh, you know, think very clearly here uh, what, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, mission is uh, for Israel. Um, they bombed these people who were uh, feeding Gazans, and now less food's going into Gaza. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's and, and, you know, there's another, um, like, the, what's the message to a Gazan um, who's able to follow this? Let's say they have access to internet or communications, right? No more food, Right. Um, also we're going to make sure that other groups aren't going to bring food because they're fearful of their life. And also look what we can do. We can just bomb, uh, you know, the, the aid that's coming in and the world and the United States won't say nothing. Maybe, you know, say, oh, they're upset about this. They won't stop this kind of shit. We run the air. We can act indiscriminately because we have protection from the United States of America, uh, to continue in your mass slaughter. But David, Brian Schatz, Senator, <laughs> I believe Senator, he's a Senator, right? He's a whole ass Senator from mm -hmm. Hawaii. Um, this is just so devastating. One of the most careful, caring, undeniably virtuous organizations. First of all, <laughs> Brian Schatz, uh, as Stephen Semler, who's a great follow on these issues, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, pointed out, um, Semler voted for, or Schatz voted for, to give Israel um, $3.8 in unconditional military aid. He also voted for Biden's foreign aid bill, which gives $14.1 billion. Uh, and, you know, I'd also point out, um, as people will point out, as others will, um, $185,000 from Israel and the pro Israel lobby. And, like, I also feel like it's worth going back to the fact that when. People think of APAC. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's worth going back to the history there of like, is it just to support, um, you know, a, a Jewish homeland following the Holocaust? Well, it was actually formed a little bit after that. And uh, here is um, a guy, Doug Rossenow, in the Washington Post, which is, you know, comparative to the um, New York Times has been better, <laughs> which is not to say good on, on Israel-Palestine. But anyway, the dark roots of APAC, uh, America's pro-Israel lobby. A group was formed to spin positive PR after Israeli atrocities, Rossna writes. Um, um, oh, why isn't... Oh, yeah. But, um, but on October 15th, 1953, all hell broke loose. News spread that an Israeli army unit had struck into the Jordanian-occupied West Bank and committed a massacre in the Palestinian village of Kibya, more, killing more than 60 civilians indiscriminately in retaliation for the murder of a Jewish woman and her two children in Israel on the night of October 12th. Um, the Time magazine carried a shocking account of deliberate, even casual mass murder by Israeli soldiers in Kibia, slouching, smoking, and joking. The New York Times ran extensive excerpts from uh, uh, a UN commission that refuted Israeli lies about the incident. Israel's most active U.S. supporters realized how severe the danger of damage to Israel was. Karen Kennan wrote of the ill effect of Kibia on what he called our propaganda after Kibia. Dulles confirmed for the first time, Alan Dulles confirmed mm -hmm. for the first time that. Uh, Washington was holding up aid to Israel. The United States supported a censure of Israel in the uh, UN Security Council. U.S. aid soon resumed after Israel pledged it would stop its work at the controversial water diversion site. Um, and, you know, I would recommend that piece just generally um, because this is what APAC does. It buys our politicians silence about massacres, and it's been doing it since the 50s. And so mm -hmm. when Brian Schatz gets in here and despite voting for policy that it keeps these bombs flowing and these arms flowing to Israel, cries crocodile tears for these dead people, it's a it's a fucking performance. And it is getting really difficult to continue to swallow. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it is tremendously clear um, here that it's absolutely absurd for someone to be sitting in the United States government, um, you know, yeah crying crocodile tears as this is ongoing when it could not go on without the United States role here. Like this is not a passive relationship is, is, is the point. It's right. not just like, Oh, we want a symbolic statement from a group of senators to stand out and say this. No, the United States government has a material relationship with the state of Israel and particularly and most importantly right now with the military of Israel condition. Hell, we shouldn't be giving them weapons in the first place, right? No. But these people don't even have the temerity, the balls, whatever you want to call it, to say we're going to have conditioned aid. If the United States is going to provide you with military equipment, with military training, with military expertise, you will not use that to slaughter innocent women and children and aid workers, members of our own country, right? Um, no. That's not what we get. We get, oh man, this is so sad. As if they're just sort of watching and, you know, oh, I'm bearing witness to this tragedy. You participate in the mass slaughter of Gazans. This it's is policy. a part, yes, this is American exactly. policy here. Yep. Yep. I mean, like, look, like all this stuff is performance because when they actually get to vote on bills that say budget priorities, it's defund UNRWA. Why is World Central Kitchen even relied on mm -hmm. to get food into this place? It's because America decided we're going to pass a budget that says uh, these people who feed Palestinians are terrorists. Actually, we agree with Israel on that. Yeah, there's no there is no. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's interesting. We had, uh, a Nell Sheline on who recently, uh, resigned from the state department, um, on majority today, um, over, you know, the support for Israel. And she made an interesting point, which is that actually there are people within the state department who would uh, have the work ready to go. If we want to start enforcing human rights on Israel, if we want to actually take a different tack that work, we actually have a huge bureaucracy and people actually you know, spend some time on that sort of thing, but it's not going to happen because of Joe Biden. 
Mm-hmm. It's it's at the top. It is he is he is stopping certain avenues of policy from being explored, diplomacy from being explored, and entrenching a one that supports genocide that covers his party in blood. And we're supposed to fight fascism. Look, I agree mm-hmm. about Project Twenty Twenty Five. Like I a lot, I actually don't. I think the downplaying of that, like it's not super convincing to me. But also the come join with us in support of a Holocaust across the globe to fight fascism at home. It not, it doesn't work for me. You can't do that. You, this is, you can't, you can't invoke fascism and support what's going on in Israel right now. It's disgusting. It's, and it's clearly like meant to actually short circuit it. So I don't know, like it's, we're in a, we're, we are on a slope downward um, towards oh, a lot yeah. of that stuff. And, you know, Biden and the folks who want to make apologies for that are are as responsible as anybody. Yeah. And, you know, so I'll just note um, really quick here, um, you know, that Joe Biden uh, did call Jose Andreas after um, after the, the killing of those aid workers. Um I mean, I guess Joe Biden said he was sorry uh, that that those bombs were actually meant for for children. Um, he's sorry that they hit those aid workers. I mean, you know, um, you know, truly a, a joke in, in you know, to even be talking like this. Um, just something to note for people who aren't as familiar with DC that like it does matter um, a bit that this is Jose Andres. Jose Andres is somebody um, who you know doesn't have the best politics, um, and also locally in DC is somebody who has sort of waged war on uh, on uh, on. Uh, um, restaurant workers, um, you know, fought against fair wages uh, for them in order to keep the nasty uh, tipped wage and and low minimum wage uh, for for workers. Right. So I'm not the biggest fan of Jose Andres. Um, this stuff, you know, going and taking care of people and feed people, that's good, you know, human work. Um, so you know, I won't get into any of that kind of stuff right now. But what does matter and has been pointed out by a few folks is that Jose Andres in in a city that is built around wine and happy hour and late night dinners. Jose Andreas is a God. He is somebody who has, you know, some of the biggest restaurants in DC. He's somebody who powerful people like to be around. They like to uh, frequent his places. So the fact that this happened to Jose Andres's group um, may, might matter, um, which is so perverse uh, to think about it. Uh, you know, that DC uh, might start to move on this, not because of their hearts, but because of their stomachs. Um, it's but up in Sinclair, uh, <laughs> uh, sort of special for it right there, but you know, we'll, you know, we'll see, um, because every time you think that maybe something will move these schools, um, you, you, you will be disappointed very, very quickly. Now in the interest of time, Matt, um, I, we have clips from, um, are two boys, but I think you should pick which one uh, we would like to see. Let's go with Kirby. Kirby right. is the this just is a slapstick clown of genocide. I think Matt Miller, whatever his name is, <laughs> you know, he's less obviously cartoonish. So th- this is a clip here um, that I think is, is is important here, and this is from Halal Flow, um, also a great uh, Twitter follow as well. Um, this is from earlier today, uh, where Kirby. Um, is basically challenged on this idea that, you know, Israel is supposed to have this hyper precise technology, right? That's why it's okay that they can bomb residential neighborhoods because, oh, they, they hit their target. Um, but also, I guess sometimes they just do a big whoopsie, but also hit a precision strike on the logo of this uh, humanitarian aid organization. But anyway, let's play this, this clip here and see how he tries to wriggle his way out of this one. I'll do it again. Excuse me. Kirby, Israel has killed a senior Hamas leader in Beirut with precision weapons in an area where thousands of civilians were there. They killed senior Iranian officials in Damascus, in the heart of Damascus, was serious, but there were thousands of civilians there as well. Um, does it make sense to you that a vehicle marked with World Central Kitchen, after coordinating with the Israelis, that they didn't see it? And does this debunk your theory and defense of Israel that it is difficult for them because Hamas embedded with the civilian population where they can go after Hamas leaders in the heart of a civilian population in Beirut and in Damascus? To your second question, no. It's not my theory. Um, I have talked about, well, now just hang on just a second now. We have talked about this for months now. Fighting in an urban, highly populated, condensed environment like that's tough. 
Uh, but they have taken strikes against Hamas leaders in, successfully taken strikes against Hamas leaders in Gaza. I can't speak to what happened in Damascus. That, I can only tell you that the United States wasn't involved. So I'm not going to talk about the details of that whatsoever. I'm telling you that they have taken precise strikes against Hamas in Gaza. They have also taken strikes that have been not precise. It looks as if very clearly what happened yesterday is one of those examples. They'll investigate that. And our expectation is, and we've made this clear to them, that they'll come clean about what they've learned. They'll be fully sure. transparent. And if people need to be held accountable, that they'll be held accountable. For sure. For sure. What would you learn? What did you learn? Um. I can't wait till that investigation is done. They, Israel really will get to the bottom of, of that. And have. just a reminder, it was three times. Yeah. The vehicles, I mean, I'll, I'll pull up the, I should actually pull up the thing. Like the Haaretz very explicitly talks about um let's see if i have that um yeah no no I man I, mean, I think it like getting that timeline um right for folks who aren't like getting it said like yeah again this wasn't like one strike or you know a missile fail or something like that this was one two three right um you have a time in between um so this was something yeah. that was planned this was not something that was just a kind of spur of the moment <clears throat> and again as you saw in that image we shoot, showed y'all earlier, um, that was a precision strike through the top of the ve the vehicle. Um, so you know to sit here, yeah. Here I'll make this larger big here. here. A few minutes later, the three cars left the warehouse without the truck on which the ostensibly armed man was located. Uh, ostensibly, you know, oh, we saw a guy with a gun. According to the uh, defense sources, the armed man did not leave the warehouse. The cars traveled along a route pre-approved and coordinated with the IDF. At some point when the convoy is driving along the approved route, the war room of the unit responsible for the security of the route ordered the drone operators to attack one of the cars with a missile. Some of the passengers were seen leaving the car after it was hit and switching to one of the other two cars. They continued to drive and even notified the people responsible that they uh, were attacked. But seconds later, another missile hit the car. Uh, hit their car and I'll just uh, scroll up a little bit um, here. Jesus Christ. I mean, what, what tremendous horror. Yeah. Um, the third car in the convoy approached and the passengers began to transfer to it. Uh, the wounded who had survived the second strike in order to get them out of danger. But then the third missile struck them. All seven world central kitchen volunteers were killed in that strike. So, I mean, you know, it is what it, it's just murder. Yeah. And again, you have to pick your lane. Um, this is something that you learn in media too, is like sometimes you sort of have to pick your position on things. And it's either that, you know, Israel operates uh, an incredibly precise, well oiled a military machine, um, or it is just indiscriminately killing people. Um, and to sit here and, and be like, they, they can be precise when they're firing into a, um, into a neighborhood. Yeah. Um, but also, uh, on pre-approved routes uh, for aid workers. Uh, no, um, you know, it, it, it is one of those things where it's, it's an insult to the American people. Um, it's an insult uh, certainly to the Palestinians and to the globe, uh, just the, the, the way that these folks lie, um, you know, and, 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 and truly, um, you know, to talk about the, the Trump Biden thing. I mean, how many years of, Oh, I can't believe this has been said at an official American um, you know, press conference, right? You know, what happened to the sanctity? You were watching the Democratic Party and the Biden administration stomp on any value of 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 of, of democracy, of having government the government be accountable to the people. Um, I mean, it is an insult to you, the viewer, to you, the American citizen, when you see American officials go up there and lie in the way that they have been doing uh, during this conflict. Yeah, it's um, it's it's you know it's something we've always said, uh, e even before when the Biden administration was just getting in. Like, look, these spokespeople uh, are liars. They are paid liars. Mm -hmm. Every administration, uh, you know, you should not. They're not worse because they work for Trump, right? But even I gotta say, like. And I'm sure like the Vietnam era, you had some real <laughs> doozy press conferences going on there. Mm -hmm. um, but this is this is really, I think, um, a low, a low point for even that disgraceful uh, position. Yeah. Well, um, you know, we'll keep on 
covering this. I think that all the, the, the folks out there who have been working on on showing up um, and challenging the uh, Biden administration are doing good and important work. Um, and I think, uh, you know, continuing that fight is something that is explicit, uh, sorry, extremely important uh, for us to be to be engaged in right now. Yeah. Shout out to the people who have gotten Karine Jean-Pierre's face. Um, <laughs> so it's especially good with her because you know it hurts because she's criticized Israel before being, you know, part of the uh, the sort of state. Um, and, you know, yeah, the, you see people like that get your phone up and harass them. That's like mm. the very least that you could you possibly do. Well, um, I think we might pop over to our interview uh, with Matt Huber. And I'll, I'll just say this before uh, going in, uh, you know, to this, um, you know, some folks have asked me why uh, do we spend, um, you know, time or so much time on questions like degrowth? Um, well, one, um, because, you know, I think it's worthwhile um, interacting with ideas out there. Um, but more importantly, um, and, and, and the reason why it, it, it frustrates and affects me so much is that, you know, a few years ago, I remember when uh, Bernie Sanders announced uh, the Green New Deal policy. Uh, we were actually, the three of us, you, me, and Michael, uh, were on our way to Chicago um, when that, that briefing dropped. Um, and I just remember being so excited um, about a kind of policy out there that was doing the work of confronting climate change, trying to fundamentally um, rework the way Americans interact with energy, um, but most importantly, doing it in a way that was going to be a market improvement of the lives of not just um, you know everybody in a holistic way, but specifically for the people who work um, in, in you know in extractive and the fossil fuel industry, it was a promise for working class Americans for a better life. Um, it was something that was tremendously inspiring when you saw that inspiration all across um, you know the United States, and then in fact the Green New Deal became a rallying cry um, for left and and socialist movements the world over. The idea that we should invest in taking on climate change and do that as a way to rework um, the economy so that it works for everybody else. Uh, for, oh, sorry, that, that works for the vast majority of us. Fast forward a few years later, folks who just a couple years back recognized that America is a country built on extreme poverty and extreme deprivation for the masses. Just a couple years later, seeing things like, oh, you know, American workers are privileged, sitting on top, living high on the hog, um, and they need to see their standard of living decline, um, not improve, um, and turn their back on a project like the Green New Deal in favor of something that I think is very clearly at this point uh, can be labeled as green austerity. Now, you can say it's a nice austerity or whatever you want, um, but this is something that is the complete opposite <laughs> of what the Green New Deal was, what the Green New Deal promised. And, you know, and Saito, who we're going to talk about in a second, literally penned the piece in The Nation magazine I'm calling the Green New Deal the opiate of the masses, right? Now, again, you can disagree with my politics. That's fine, right? But I think that people who have sort of gotten you know, worked up in this whole degrowth thing, who just a few years ago uh, were saying, I believe in the Green New Deal, I'm going to go knock on doors for the Green New Deal, should ask themselves why they have turned their back on a politics like the Green New Deal and instead embraced a, a politics like degrowth, um, which again – pits working people oftentimes as the villain um, and, you know, turns us back on, I think, the, the more radical and important aspirations uh, that were outlined in, 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 in the Green New Deal and I think more broadly in the radical um, tradition of, of the socialist movement. But anyways, that's, you know, a little preamble. We're going to talk a bit about degrowth, but we're specifically going to spend some time talking about Saito's uh, work uh, that, uh, that has been translated into English recently. Matt Huber is always great. There are links below uh, to read the review in Jackman Magazine, uh, Matt Huber and Fred Stafford's new piece in Damage Magazine, which I highly suggest uh, reading that piece and also subscribing to Damage. And if you haven't already, I can't believe, I can't believe if you haven't, but you should be buying Matt Huber's book, Climate Change is Class War. Um, it really is, I think, a foundational text uh, for uh, you know reviving that kind of radical socialist politics. So anyways, enough from me, folks. Uh, we'll go over uh, to the interview. Oops. Sorry, I thought I was going to be able to. No, we had a perfect, and then. <laughs> well, so it's I'll just like 
it's been i don't know if you've been experiencing this david but like when you bring up the clips there's been a little pause so i was yeah. just trying to anticipate a little bit the no i'm sorry yeah. all right enjoy friends <laughs> um but first of all matt thank you so much welcome back left reckoners david here uh joined as usual by one matt um but in a special double feature we're joined by another matt our good friend matt huber um matt huber is a regular guest on this program uh, we're a big fan of matt's work uh you can uh, pick up their books read their their pieces in jackman we'll have a bunch of links below um uh, to read their work including in damage magazine which we might be able to talk about a little bit later um, but first of all, I mean, Matt, thank you so much uh, for joining us again on Left Reckoning. I always love to join you guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's going to be fun uh, because we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is uh, degrowth. Um, but specifically, uh, we wanted to talk about there's I mean, there's a book that if you're on the left, if you spend any time um, on Twitter or um I know just in left wing uh, spaces, there's a book that's been getting a lot of buzz or a couple books actually that have been getting a lot of buzz on the left um, by uh, the scholar uh, Kohei Saito. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that they're worth engaging with and talking about what's in them. And you, along with Lee Phillips, uh, wrote a really great uh, review um, in Jack Bin uh, called uh, um, Kohei Saito's uh, Start from Scratch Degrowth Communism. Um, yeah, and I mean, like, look, there's a lot, um, you know, to sort of get into with this. We could talk about degrowth as like a general philosophy. I will say, if this is the first time you've seen us interview Matt Huber, um, I might suggest maybe watching some of those other videos that we've done on degrowth, uh, because we do want to spend a little bit more time focusing on on Saito's particular work instead of degrowth as a whole. Though I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit in this video, um, but do just want to suggest people check those out. But I mean, so. This is a person who wrote a book that made it on the bestseller list, at least in Japan, um, got a lot of buzz, which is not something that you sort of expect hell, um, let alone with degrowth, but just with sort of like political economy. Um, I mean, how would you sort of categorize, uh, you know, Saito's work? I mean, what is it that has drawn so much attention, uh, you know, to, to these books that he's put together? Well, um, I think I have a, I have a theory that, uh, Degrowth is most popular in what could be called stagnant, non-growing economies. <laughs> like, um, you know, I, I, when my book came out, I went through, um, did a bunch of events in Europe. And, you know, degrowth is huge over there. <laughs> like, in, in, in sort of these economies that had a huge period of growth in the post-World War II era, but then hit this kind of, you know, what some Marxists call a kind of long downturn in the 1970s and then went into this kind of period of low growth and stagnation. Um, I think this, and, and you know, like these are economies too that have been stuck in this kind of, uh, uh, you know, focus on uh, consumerism and mass consumption, that sort of residue of that post-war era. And so I think, um, you know, in particularly in Japan, it's clear there's a hunger for kind of critiques of this sort of stagnant capitalist system, uh, critiques of consumerism. And there's a, a general sense that the people living in these kind of stagnant, you know, so-called rich economies are, um, you know, part of larger global processes that are leading to the massive ecological breakdown all around the world and climate change. And so I do think there's this kind of argument about degrowth and kind of slow, you know, one of the books is called slow down. Like this really appeals to a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, middle-class kind of consumer living in these kind of stagnant, um, industrialized economies like Japan. So. Yeah. I mean, um, so I, I want to get to some of the, the stuff about Marx in, in a minute, but I would gather that for most of our audience, um, the first question um, is 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 going to be about uh, you know degrowth as an idea, right? Is sort of I think the way the best kind of argument for it, or the typical one that you'll see, is that there is a kind of natural limit uh, to the planet, right? To like life, yeah. um, and we are basically under capitalism are, are running up um, against that. 
Um, and degrowthers are sort of uh, present themselves as the people who are taking this seriously, uh, while folks who are called quote unquote Prometheans or eco modernists um, sort of are trying to sweep this uh, under the rug. Um, so before we get into like Saito and stuff, I mean, I just wanted to, you know, ask you sort of point blank. You know, are there limits, uh, you know, uh, to life on this planet? Um, is that question fair in the way that it's kind of uh, framed? I mean, you know, if you could just sort of speak to that very quickly so we can get into some of the, the other issues with degrowth. Yeah. And, and to situate it, it you, there's a whole history of um, scholars and thinkers who have sort of projected these these fixed uh, limits to growth um, and crucial kind of ecological limits to the capacity of societies to grow. So obviously this, uh, well, before I get into this, I should say first off that yes, there are like clearly ecological limits. And we say that in the piece there, you know, mm. humanity is always facing particular ecological constraints that are constraining what we can do on this planet and in society. And that's kind of got to be something that's always informing any kind of socialist approach to kind of taking control over production, planning. You want to plan in, in, in accordance with those those real material constraints and, and you can't escape them um, uh, as much as you can develop technologies that can, uh, you know, negotiate them in different ways. So that being said, um, there is though this problematic history of like projecting these really fixed and rigid limits to growth. And that goes back to the political economist Thomas Malthus basically said that, uh, you know, their, you know, population growth is, is going to increase exponentially, but food production and land production can only increase in a linear fashion. And ultimately that population is going to outstrip our kind of fixed natural um, uh, food production capacities. He made this argument uh, to argue against welfare for the poor because he thought if we help the poor they'll just ha have more children and then it'll make the problem worse <laughs> and so he was like very you know a, it was a class argument against the poor but it was uh and and then of course in the wake of this argument what did capitalism do it just massively developed uh as we'd say developed the productive forces of agriculture that just shot through any kind of uh limits about uh food production that would uh, worry us about in relation to population. So now, of course, there are 8 billion people on the planet, but we produce enough food to probably feed close to 10, 12 billion people. We produce, we have way more food production capacity than than we um, uh, know what to do with, yet we still in capitalism have all this hunger and, and poverty and scarcity that's completely social. Um, and... Um, so then fast forward to the 19, 1960s. So Malthus wrote this essay in 1798 and revised it in the early 19th century. Then in the 1960s, you get the rise of the modern environmental movement, who sometimes is not uh, using Malthus directly, but basically repackages these ideas of, of limits to growth. And obviously, there was the Club of Rome that came out with this huge scientific report called The Limits to Growth. And this is in the context of the post-World War II era where all our economic policy attention is focused on, you know, GDP growth. And, 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 and this is seen as a barometer of the health of the economy. So it was sort of this ecological answer to uh, this growth economy. And, and then you had more egregious kind of just blatantly racist versions of this, like um, uh, Paul Ehrlich wrote a book called The Population Bomb, which basically, again, like Malthus himself, focused on where is population growing, poor developing mm -hmm. countries, and then they're like about to ignite this bomb on the planet and we have to stop them. You know, he went to India and saw a bunch of people and it freaked them out. So he wrote a book about it. <laughs> it's like literally like racist. Um, and, and so you get this, this, this turn of kind of uh, what people call neo-Malthusianism in the 1970s. And out of that comes a school of uh, economists that call themselves ecological economists who are really concerned about what they call the energetic limits to growth. They're really concerned about the fact that fossil fuels are finite and there's only so much of it and we're going to run out of it. And then, you know, this fossil fuel based civilization is going to kind of reach these thermodynamic limits. Mm -hmm. All this stew of, of kind of limits to growth thinking has a through line that goes directly to the modern degrowth kind of ideology. A lot of the 
the people that are sort of the core scholars of degrowth are themselves ecological economists. They come out of this tradition that came out of the 1970s. And nowadays, though, the, 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 the new science in vogue that people uh, use is called the science of planetary boundaries, which has laid out sort of nine, uh, you know, planetary boundaries around water use and nitrogen pollution and obviously climate change and and, um, you know, uh, a lot of them, <laughs> as uh, you, you might say, are neither planetary nor strict boundaries. Like, it's very clear when you start to dive into this science, like, they choose a boundary for land use that I think, if I recall, something like 25% of, like, the terrestrial um, land uh, bank or whatever is, is once that's get into, into use, then we've crossed this planetary boundary, but it's... The, the scientists admit that that 25% that boundary is like arbitrary. They actually don't know exactly where the boundary is. Um, and so, you know, um, this kind of science of planetary boundaries is now, and Saito, he just uses the science in the first chapters of Slow Down over and over again to show, mm -hmm. you know, these are the new, this is what the science is saying about the limits. And therefore, uh, our socialist project has to be, how do we, reorganize production to respect these planetary boundaries. Now, I'm all for like reorganizing production to respect certain ecological constraints. And I think there's some um, worry, there's some very concerns about these boundaries, not the least climate change itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the problem I see in the through line I see way back to old uh, Thomas Malthus is that they really are projecting these kind of fixed and, and intractable limits. And uh, that I think puts these kind of shackles on our vision of what we can do and what we, and for me, socialism is really about unshackling us from markets, from the profit motive to kind of really unleash human potential and all this kind of stuff. The last thing I'll say, and I know I've gone on way too long, but I'm a scholar. I kind of made my way in academia being a scholar of oil. And uh, mm. one thing I learned pretty early in my studies is that oil has, has this history of constantly these people coming out and being like, oh, my God, we're running out of oil. Like literally in the 1920s, there were these sort of crank geologists who were like, no, I've looked at the numbers and we're about to reach the limits of our oil and we have to plan for. And of course, you know, the, the ecological economists from the 70s were all uh, sort of they started to inform this kind of peak oil theory. And a lot of their kind of uh, projections about peak oil really pointed to the, the early 2000s where we're going to reach global peak oil. And this is when I was doing my dissertation when basically peak oil mania was kind of going going wild. And then, you know, uh, unfortunately, capital is really good at finding oil when the price goes high. <laughs> and capital just, you know, developed fracking and then found all this other oil all over the uh, world. And there's still really, we haven't even began to unlock the potential of fracking on a global scale, which is kind of terrifying given climate change. And so um, the, the point being that all these sort of efforts to always sort of project and predict where the hard lines and, and limits on these resources are, 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 are not always so clear and not always successful in predicting those limits. And it's clear that they're not always so fixed and immutable. Um, and, 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 it, and it's actually capitalism that's shown that uh, more often than not, we shoot through these limits through technological changes and so forth. So, I mean, like, um, you know, I, I want to get to the Marxism aspect of this too, because, you know, the, the, this degrowth per, uh, tradition and Saito in particular, like claims, uh, Marx in, in a pretty shocking way uh, that we'll get into in a second. But just like on this question of like fixed limits, um, I just want to put something to you. I mean, it's like a, a way to think about it too is that, um, you know, it's like, what kind of limits are, are we talking about? So like in this, you know, in the sense it's like, there is a limit on how much fossil fuel we can burn and, and maintain a certain environment. Right. But that's a different thing from, you know, having air conditioning in a home um, or having an electrified home because there are different ways to, for example, produce electricity. Yes. So if you're operating from a mentality of saying, oh, you know, uh, let's, uh, a certain lifestyle um, or way of living, which again is like, you know, so broad of a conception in the first place. Like you have to sometimes get into the nuts and bolts of it, you know, can actually obscure that like, oh, well, probably what we need to be doing is building out clean energy like solar, wind, nuclear power um, and transitioning away from fossil fuels, for example. Right. Like that's something that is like, you know, that's interacting with a limit. 
um, and recognizing that there are certain kinds of limits without what the degrowth crowd tends to do, which is say, hey, there's a problem in modern production. Um, and instead of sort of, I don't know, imagining ways to sort of use technology and resources and labor to overcome those, it's a kind of retreat. Oh, we will just stop, you know, heating, uh, cooling our homes in the summer, heating them in the winter, et cetera. Right. I mean, is that fair enough? Yeah, absolutely. And for, and for whatever reason, again, um, it's funny in my book, I have these different categories of professional class, climate, political people, and. I put the degrowthers in the, what I call the radical anti-system people. They're all about like capitalism's the problem. And, um, but the more I've been engaging with them, which has been way too long at this point, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I realize they're actually quite deeply in this science communicator uh, uh, mm. sort of personality I, 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 I projected to because they always are using like the science says planetary boundaries, thus we must do X. And what they say is the science of climate change means uh, we must reduce our energy consumption, particularly in the global north, because that's just if we're going to decarbonize fast enough, we have to reduce. Right. But as you're saying, it's actually not really a quantitative question as much as a qualitative one. It's about qualitative transformation of the energy system as rapidly as possible toward these clean energy sources. And that, and and once you do that, the question of how much consumption you can have still should be something we debate in terms of you know if we're socialists like you know planning a good society like then people don't necessarily need massive houses and big like tank like SUVs and stuff like that. But the question uh, you know of climate change is really about this qualitative transformation, and mm -hmm. you know. Uh, one example I've been giving recently is um, it really like it depends, you know, your energy source really depends on whether or not it's clean or not. Right. So um, in in Quebec, they have, you know, almost 100 percent clean uh, hydropower, which for people get angry, I should point out, developing this hydropower has its own set of ecological consequences, land use problems. It's, it's had struggles with certain indigenous groups, uh, land claims in those areas. So that's. But from climate, purely climate change perspective, they Quebec has this like totally decarbonized hydro based energy system. Therefore, and I learned in Quebec, they they really waste a lot of energy. They <laughs> they they use uh, resistance heating, electric heating in a very mm. cold part of the world. <laughs> like they all of them just use like electric heating because it's so cheap. And they have so much of it. They have so much abundance that they just use it. And and doing this doesn't really matter climate change wise because it's all clean right mm -hmm. now another example i was talking i was when i was in europe i was uh talking with a friend and he was talking about how you know in the in the eastern bloc in germany when uh they were under you know communism like they did develop uh more collective forms of housing more collective forms of transportation so things we as socialists would actually like like public housing public mm -hmm. transit more efficient sharing of housing and transport resources. But the problem was that the, the Eastern Bloc was all powered by coal. Right? So it was really dirty, really environmentally destructive. So even though they're being more efficient in the consumption side, they're, they're, um, they're having horrible environmental impacts. So really, you know, uh, so mm. whether or not you're efficient or wasteful on the consumption side really is contention on what does the production look like. And, and that's what uh, decarbonization really has to focus on, that we need to rapidly decarbonize that production system. And then, and then, yeah, if we get more power over production, let's sort of have a collective debate over how much energy we need as a society, what, what, is, what is useful to power in our lives and, and these types of questions. But the, the main thing is qualitative transformation of that energy system. I mean, this is sort of what has always been my problem with degrowth, which is I'm sympathetic, obviously, to the way of stating acutely the problems uh, and the urgency of the situation. But the, it seems like a complete dumbness to the political realities. And like all this comes in an austerity era post great financial crisis, where if you if your main demand is we need less. Yeah, like the powers that be can be like, OK, I can deliver that uh, easily. <laughs> like we can just call this new stuff this is uh, this we're just degrowthing instead of austerity no yeah i mean you know the degrowthers 
uh, will reply that say, but no, we actually want to give, you know, people more. We want to give shorter working week. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm down with that. Let's degrow the working week. Right. That's cool. But that's mm -hmm. they, they do this thing where they kind of appropriate old socialist demands that have been socialist demands forever. Like they want more public uh, services and public housing. Yeah. So did socialists in the 1920s. You're not really changing. But but they have to they have to situate these kind of more progressive and socialist types of demands that the working class would say this is beneficial this is not austerity right but they have to couple this because they have to call it degrowth with an overarching um focus on reductions right so mm -hmm. the the any sort of programmatic definition of degrowth is going to center a planned reduction of either energy use in the global north or material throughput on a global scale, whatever it is, they have to um, sort of put their, uh, dig their heels in with this sort of overarching focus on aggregate reductions in energy and material use. Um, and that's kind of uh, the focus, but you're right, politically speaking, um, it allows, uh, it, it'll, it's very easy to kind of caricature this politics that centers less as a politics of less and as a kind of something very comfortable with austerity. I thought it was funny in her short-lived uh, rule over the UK, Liz Truss came into power and she was, she was promoting her own kind of austerity agenda, but she did so in a way that um, she, she countered, she said, I'm doing, um, I'm trying to take on what she called the anti-growth coalition. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so the way in which like yeah. degrowth, just one thing, the way I've said it bef before is like, because capitalism has this kind of ideology of GDP growth and kind of this sort of, you know, degrowth is called growthism. We kind of worship this idea of growth and, and statistical GDP growth. Uh, degrowth is kind of like on the ideological terrain of that, of that capitalist ideology. And they just negate it, right? They say, we want the opposite of that. We want degrowth. But that plays right into the hands of the right and others who are able to caricature um, the left as sort of, again, like out of touch and not uh, doesn't want growth, which, again, in an age of austerity where people literally have trouble paying for their bills, there's a cost of living crisis, people can't even get the basic necessities to like this idea of not no growth or, or degrowth doesn't make a lot of sense on the surface, right? And so it's a very, it's a nice gift to the right to kind of hand them this sort of austerity sounding demand, right? Yeah, and I feel the same, I make the same critique of um, things I'm even more sympathetic to than degrowth, which is defund the police and abolish ICE. Like, I think both of those things, I, I cynically kind of think it's it, it's to kind of get in more libertarians who are tax averse when it, when it goes into that stuff. Um, but they lack actual affirmative demand of what we, okay, we exactly. want to process more people and invite them in, or we want a green new deal. Like yeah. you have to make the affirmative demand. Otherwise the, who's going to fill the vacuum? Like who's actually in power right now? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I said, let, let's not put D in front of our demands. Let's try that. <laughs> One time I looked up the, the prefix, you can search on like dictionary.com and the prefix D it says often means privation. Right? So it's like it, the very meaning of the prefix yeah. is like less and, and, and privation and, and want, right? So that's not good. Well, let's let's jump a little bit into um, some of these claims about about Marx, and I'll just say up up top for folks. I know everybody comes into these with a little different understandings of uh, you know some of these debates. Um, just so like folks are clear here, like Saito wrote an article in the Nation uh, titled "The Green New Deal is the Opiate of the Masses." Right. Yeah. So if you're somebody who, you know, sort of had supported these kind of movements and you're not understanding why it is that uh, us folks who have been very passionate and arguing for Green New Deal f are frustrated with this growth of, of this new kind of movement. Right. That might be a good example of it. But um, <laughs> um, I wanted to I really do want to make sure that we get some time in on, on, on this Mark stuff, because I think that it's like it, these claims are wild. Uh, to me, I will just say, as somebody who considers myself to be a Marxist, um, I would like it if we could maybe go one and two, right? Because he makes a bunch of claims in 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 his work, um, but uh, the the large ones are that basically Marx abandons historical materialism, and then two, he becomes a degrowth 
uh, communist. And <laughs> man, I have to ask you, um, you know, where is the, the kind of evidence? I mean, where is this argument coming from? Um, you could take them in order or holistically, however you like. Uh, yeah. And there's been other reviews before Lee and, and mine came out that, that just bluntly says like, uh, there's one we quoted where it's like, frankly, there is no evidence for these claims. <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, so, yeah, and so he, he claims that, you know, um, Marx had this sort of Promethean kind of idea that of historical materialism that capitalism develops the productive forces and develops technology to create kind of um, the preconditions for socialism. So that I, I really think it's not controversial that Marx and Engels believe that capitalism plays a progressive role in history and in kind of, um, you know, centralizing production, making it more efficient, and uh, and also, you know, creating this class we call the proletariat that, that becomes capitalism's grave diggers. And, but um, Saito kind of develops this um, idiosyncratic reading of Capital, uh, Volume 1 particularly, that argues that Marx kind of abandons this this idea about the progressive role of capitalism and about the role of the productive forces in creating the conditions for socialism. And so what he argues is that, and I think there there is some truth to it, and it's clear to Marx's analysis that the productive forces developed under capitalism are a product of the social relations and class relations of capital. So he says that that in, all the productive forces developed under capitalism are in, in sort of tied to capital, right? Tied to the class rule of capital. You know, certain technologies are developed so they can better dominate labor in the production process. And, and yes, that Marx does make these points, but he takes that to mean that what this means is that, what, that the productive forces are kind of like inherently capitalist and, and sort of stained with capital and therefore we cannot make use of them in a post-capitalist socialist society. And he says that these productive forces are going to have to disappear altogether. And we're going to have to start from scratch in terms of developing new... Saito is saying this, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Saito is saying that essentially um, because capital develops these productive forces, they're kind of inherently stained with these capitalist class social relations. And therefore that, you know, once we... Uh, move beyond capitalism, we're going to have to, this is where the title comes from, start from scratch in many cases, develop wholly new technologies and so forth. Um, and so uh, this seems, again, just sort of like, how does that work? Like, you know, to me, it seems like so basic that historical materialism is really about understanding how societies sort of develop out of existing societies, like the theory of how feudalism transitions into capitalism really tries to look at those social relations and how they build to different social relations. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 again, a pretty dramatic and bold claim to say that Marx sort of abandons this idea about capitalism's progressive role, about the centrality of the productive forces to create the material conditions for socialism. So that's the first thing about historical and, and, socialism. And it creates this kind of difficult problem uh, for Saito um, that you and, and, and Lee Phillips sort of outlined in, in the piece. We're in like the degrowth kind of manifesto, the degrowth position does sort of want us to use certain kinds of technologies, you know, mm -hmm. in certain ways. So, okay, well, if all the, you know, the technologies, you know, developed under capitalism have this like fundamental original sin or whatever, um, you know, then how do we sort of get through it? And the, uh, Saito sort of creates this thing. Um, tell me if I'm saying these wrong, but like open and locked yeah. technologies, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, which, I don't know. It's like, I guess, a clever way to get out of that problem, but it becomes fairly arbitrary in that, like, oh, well, this one, I like this one, so it's open technology, and I don't like this one as much, so it's a locked technology. Yeah. And as you all know, your piece was like, it's very kind of a classic example of degrowth in this kind of PMC position of like, oh, I've sort of decided which ones are good and which ones are bad, and we're not going to yeah. deal with right. society and democracy and all that kind of stuff. But Yeah, I mean... Much like the the 1960s, 70s sort of environmentalists, they're kind of 
they're just hostile towards all sort of big industrial technologies, right? I mean, it's a mm -hmm. reaction against industrialism or industrialization. But again, that is so any sort of large scale factory, you know, we've talked on this podcast about electricity, like big centralized mm -hmm. power plants, even, you know, um, obviously the his prime example of a, of, of a bad locking technology are new, big nuclear power plants, plants because they're big centralized kind of large scale uh, types of technologies. Um, of course, uh, out of the 60s and 70s, everyone's sort of like, no, we can have like little sort of local, small scale, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, renewable energies and, and small urban gardens. And we can kind of have these technologies that are more what they like to say, like convivial and like human centered. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, that's all good. And there's certainly plenty of environmentalists who argue for this kind of small, beautiful, small scale technology. But that couldn't be further from what Marxism was arguing, which Marxism very clearly over and over shows that what capital does is it he, he the words he uses socializes production, mm -hmm. um, even though capital r remains in control and privatizes the profits. They're actually making production more cooperative, more more reliant on the social forces of science and technology and more centralized, which is requiring like huge like armies of 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 coordinated labor. And, and it's that socialization of production that Marx argued and, and he wrote during the Industrial Revolution. So this sort of development of big centralized industrial production for him very clearly like that and particularly the way in which that production like developed labor saving technology mm -hmm. that made things more efficient, that made things um, more streamlined like that created real conditions where we could harness those technologies. And I should say change them. Right. We're not going to just take capitalist technologies and people accuse me of just keeping everything as it is. No, we'll, we'll transform them. We'll repurpose them to harness their benefits toward social needs, toward social good. But the idea that we should just reject all this industrial technological development as sort of stained with capitalism and we can move on to our good, happy, open technologies of small scale uh, production is just a, uh, you know, it's quite interesting to go back to the Communist Manifesto because Marx and Engels mm -hmm. argued against what they called reactionary socialists, right? And the reactionary socialists were the ones that wanted to hold on to kind of small scale production that had predated capitalism, small farms, small artisanal production. And um, they were like, no, you know, capitalism's creating a new future for us and we're going to expropriate this really large scale, productive, efficient, because you know what that's going to do? It's going to give us all a lot of free time. I mean, Saito yes. like says, I want free time in my little degrowth communist future, but he has no sense that if you really want a society of free time, you have to have like really efficient technology to make that happen. Sorry. No, 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 no. I mean, like 100%. And I'll just say for folks, um, you know, Matt and I have, uh, Matt Leck and I have done the, the Gotha program and the Communist Manifesto on this program. They're up for free for everyone to watch. You all watch them. And like we talk about this in depth, um, this aspect of, of Marxist thought, because it is absolutely critical, um, to Marxism. Uh, you know, this idea of, of sort of seizing these productive powers of, of, of capitalism that, you know, it's one of the fundamental contradictions of, of capitalism is that we actually have these labor saving, uh, technologies. We have the ability to produce so much and, uh, without having to use as much labor that we actually have the potential to shorten, you know, the, the amount of labor, you know, the amount of time that people spend working that we actually can live in abundance and this is why we need to overtake it so when you know somebody is sort of rejecting that that is a fundamental um you know uh, attack not just uh, like on on marx um but saying that like marx is sort of like turned their back on 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 marxism Engels is also uh, turned into a bit of a villain um, here in a kind of wild way. Um, you know, uh, y'all note that Engels uh, what uh, excised natural um, from from one line of, of Marx's writing, and yeah. this sort of creates the the conditions for for Saito to sort of just imply that Engels has been basically obscuring all of Marx's work um, to hide this. I mean, is that? <laughs> Yeah, so Engels, you know, translated Marx's notebooks into volume three. In, in volume three, there's this famous quote, which has become the one quote that inspires a whole school of ecological Marxism, where he talks about what he calls an irreparable rift between um, capitalist, capitalist production and the soil's ability to replenish waste and all this kind of stuff. And in that quote, yeah, he excised the word natural ahead of the word metabolism in certain contexts. Mm -hmm. 
And Engel, or sorry, uh, Saito uses this as evidence that Engels was like repressing Marx's ecological awakening in the 1870s and um, was trying to kind of uh, downplay this. And even uh, someone who I think for most of history has been quite aligned with Kohei Saito is John Bellamy Foster. He wrote a review, mm-hmm. well, not a review, just an essay recently where he's just like, this, this, this doesn't really mean as much as Saito seems to think it means. Uh, like just moving this one word doesn't mean that like him and Marx were drifting apart and like they were <laughs> having all these different views. And, and we, we'll get, I'm sure we'll get into it, but Saito argues Marx becomes a degrowth communist in the mm-hmm. 1870s. And he also says that Engels wasn't aware of this. <laughs> Engels was in the dark about this. And, uh, and, and then eventually, like when there's evidence out there that Engels claims, you know, Engels said that Marx reviewed uh, his publication that, you know, part of it became socialism, utopian, scientific, but the bigger one is called anti During. And this is like a straightforwardly historical materialist, like, you know, like an industry is coming and we're going to harness it, abolish poverty, abolish <laughs> class rule. It's going to be great. You know, Engels claims Marx reviewed all that. He agreed with it. He said it was. And then Saito just says, well, you know, you look into the notebooks and the uh, letters and it's pretty not credible that Marx really did that. And Engels is lying and he tries to turn <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> like turn Ingalls into like uh, again like a villain villain sort of liar who's repressing this ecological degrowth marks that he doesn't want the world to know. Um, well, and, you know, and it's also you know to be fair, um, it'd be very. I mean, look, I know all these Ingalls and Marx believed that the work that they were doing was changing the world, but let's not forget that you know. Marx made a difference politically in Europe at that time, but nowhere near what he is to us today, right? You know, this was not somebody who was like at that and in his actual life, um, you know, somebody who was able to influence the world in the way that his writing ended up uh, doing later. So it would be very prescient, I guess, is what I'm saying, of angles to be very worried about, you know, oh man, this text is going to be misinterpreted a hundred years from now. So I better, you know, mess with this um, or that. Um, Go ahead. I'm sorry, just generically, like, this is all, co- like, these sort of, this sort of trivia about production, whether it's, like, translation stuff, like, that's interesting if it can be backed up with, like, a look at actually what the text was and the significance that's supposedly perverted on it. But beyond that, like, this is just nonsense. Well, yeah. <laughs> Ironically, like, Engels did more to popularize Marxism than Marx was able to do because mm-hmm. it's, it's sad for good old... Carl, because he passes away in 1883, and really in in the 12 years between that and when Engels passes away in 1895, you know Engels he he really like spreads the good word of Marxism <laughs> far and wide, right? Like in in its texts like Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific that were probably read way more by more uh, labor parties, socialist parties, workers parties, and more workers uh, that were struggling in those movements were reading these kind of more straightforward, to be honest, popularized versions of Marxism that Engels was able to really uh, spread uh, in those years. Some were also reading Capital, which is kind of the magnum opus, and it's mm-hmm. uh, it's got incredible analysis. But, you know, I think less were reading that than were reading what Engels was sort of using as kind of translations of Marxist ideas. So, um, just in interest of time, I mean, unless there's something that you want to add, I, I feel like the the Marx basically becoming a, a secret degrowth communist too um, is is a fairly similar aspect, um, you know, to to the abandoning of, of historical materialism, where it's like hyper focusing on you know a very small segment of, of Marx's work, a letter, if I'm you know getting that correct. Oh um, well, some notebooks that he transcribed. You know, and again, people should read the the review to really get into this um, because I want to talk about what this sort of means, right? Um, in the review, there's links below. Uh, please read it. Um, but I mean, there's just two things, um, and one, you know, you know, both of them in, in the piece. It's like, well, one is, well, what does this mean? Um, you know, if these things were true, which you know, I think arguably it's like very clear that they're not. But what does this mean? I mean, it basically means that Marx turned their back on on their work towards the end of their life. And then, well, what is Marxism, right? So, you know, what what is the point in claiming this in the first place if you're basically saying that it doesn't, uh, you know, speak the truth, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it 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 really in, invalidates the large. That's sort of most of the canon that we associate with Marxism, you know, 
like particularly the Communist Manifesto, which is a such a brilliant mm -hmm. articulation of of this sort of theory of history that they were developing at the time. And I myself would never want to say that. Oh, that's the bad Promethean Marxism. I mean, there's so much. <laughs> there's, I mean, I really believe that a lot of the ideas in that document they 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 hung on to those till they died. I really believe that. You know, obviously they're always revising their thought and they're thinking through things differently. Um, this letter to Versulich, you know, she's a, this Russian um, uh, sort of more on the agrarian kind of populist side of, of the movement who they were just trying to figure out, um, did, uh, you know, can Russia transition to communism without going through uh, the capitalist industrial transformation themselves? And Marx said, yes, for sure. Um, as long as you appropriate the benefits from capitalism that happen elsewhere. And he, so he said, if there's a revolution in Western Europe, yes, Russia can then appropriate all the technology and the productive forces that capitalism needs to develop. Uh, and, um, and he, he makes these comments that, you know, you could learn from, uh, these communes, these sort of collective communes that were in Russia, these rural um, mirror kind of uh, communal forms of agriculture, like those types of social relations could help inform your transition to communism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so there, it was a nuanced kind of advice to this movement in Russia that said, like, really, you know, communism is about the emancipation of the global proletariat. And if you're sort of situated in the global proletarian uh, revolution, you can benefit from that. But he says clearly in this letter that, um, you know, uh, these communes are going to have to be sort of transitioned into much more efficient and high technology of agriculture. And, and, and that, you know, it's only going to work if it's in conjunction with all the technology from the West. Right. So unfortunately, Saito then reads this letter as, as sort of advocating for because these communes are kind of static and developmentally sort of steady. He says that he's advocating for a kind of steady state economy, an economy mm -hmm. that is not growing that is sort of uh sort of circular right um but that's just not really in the letter at all um and sort of bizarre so it's it, it is it is truly odd um <laughs> and as somebody who's like my you know academic background was in philosophy i i, I just have a real exhaustion with any kind of like secret or implicit meanings in text um but <laughs> i want to ask in, in the last couple of minutes because uh, i think this is really important here um is is in Saito's, Saito's work in particular but in degrowth as a whole i mean there is this kind of tension um with how it wants to interact with marxism um because marxism has a very clear subject which is the working class of proletariat um, you know, this degrowth communism gets into a lot of trouble uh, when we start trying to figure out who it is that's supposed to take action. As you note in your piece, you know, Saito is a little bit unclear. Um, it sounds to me a lot like the weird kind of post-Marxist stuff uh, that we argue against a lot in this program, too, or it's kind of like a movement of movements or how could we do socialist politics without the working class, basically, is my um, my perspective on it. But I mean, you know, who is the subject here? I mean, you know, is, is that something that is sort of an afterthought? Um, you know, what, what is going on with this addition to supposedly like Marx is converting away from his own philosophy to this degrowth communism? I mean, who ends up becoming the subject of history? This, you know, telling. If there is a subject um, in the book that sold so well, 500,000 copies, slow down. The working class is literally mentioned four times, like it never in any central way. So literally like from both books, really the working class or the, or the role of the proletariat in ushering, it's just not even, not even acknowledged or dealt with. It's just not mm -hmm. even on the table. Right. He did a uh, interview recently for new left review where he, he talked about giving up his naive ideas of working class politics. So that might be, you know, I've been trained in academia and you learn very early in academia that cool, you can do Marxism. Yeah, we are, we love Marxism because we love to critique capitalism because we don't like capitalism, but give up this, this idea of working class, uh, you know, agency and kind of these old ideas of, you know, seizing factories and that scene is sort of old problematic Marxism. We're going to leave that aside. Um, so, uh, so yeah, like, so for him, like there's just a lot of vague gestures to obviously the, 
if there's any agent in, in the book, it's the global south, right? It's like sort of the global south of oppressed peoples are going to kind of rise up in a, 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 a revolt against this sort of destructive ecological system. But he also really spends a lot of time like celebrating um, sort of small scale ecological movements in cities like, you know, you know, taking control over food production mm -hmm. in uh, urban gardens, taking, you know, developing public housing, uh, some things that are sort of under the rubric of what's called ecological municipalism, sort of like small sort of uh, cooperatives. Oh, he really is into worker cooperatives. He's really into, um, which is very standard for degrowth, sort of celebrating peasant movements and via Campesina to take control over their own land and sovereignty and food sovereignty, which I think anyone should support, but um, doesn't necessarily solve the problems of how we deal with the, you know, six billion people who've been pushed off the land and are proletarianized mm -hmm. and reliant on commodities for survival. And, uh, and that's sort of what Marx was referring to as the proletariat majority that's sort of been forced to rely on markets and money for survival. And, and, and that's was his agent of change. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it, you know, in, in the chapter, which lays out his sort of political theories, there's a lot of like these buzzwords, like creating autonomous zones, creating horizontal solidarity. You know, it sounds like a lot of the kind of buzzwords of Occupy and, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the World <laughs> Social Forum and the kind of this, this sort of thing that, you know, it felt like for me, and I'm sure you guys agree that in the, in the kind of last decade, it felt like we were at least sort of moving away from that kind of horizontalist kind of, but it's very present in this analysis. So. Well, I mean, that's the thing that is so uh, funny, I mean, at least to me, is that like in practice, I think the, you know, what I would call, you know, like, um, yeah, this like post Marxism, um, you know, stuff very inspired by Laclau and Mouf, um, you know, sort of got us as trial run, particularly with like Podemos in Spain. Um, and we saw it, that, that kind of left populism lose. And there's something very odd about degrowth where a lot of its political strategy does just seem to be, let's do the 2010s again, but with, an even less popular slogan. <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, yeah, it's. It, it, <laughs> um, I mean, there. Sometimes it just feels like anarchism. Like, um, mm -hmm. and there's this one footnote where he he quotes someone's idea of sort of anarchist communism and endorses that. That he says that's what I mean when I say degrowth communism. I mean anarchist communism. Uh, in particularly in relation to the Paris Commune. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are other times where he sort of denounces anarchism, but to me, a lot of this kind of like small scale horizontalist uh, solutions, you know, there's no theory of the state or how you would actually achieve state power in any of this analysis. He doesn't, like I said, he doesn't mention unions or the trade union movement. So mm -hmm. to me, it feels very akin to anarchism and kind of small scale sort of horizontalist solutions. And then the question becomes, okay, if, if you're promoting this kind of anarchist uh, politics, why are you so hitching your wagon to Marxism? Like, why is Marx the mm -hmm. big profit for your whole analysis? And then I think, honestly, it's because in academia, like there's a lot of interest in Marx, right? Like you're, you know, Marx mm -hmm. is kind of very fascinating. There's in, and to his credit, Saito is like, done a lot of archival research on Marx's letters and Marx's notebooks. And there's just a huge, there's a huge uh, world out there of, of Marxology and Marx studies. And I think he's really invested in that world. And, and unfortunately, he's trying to kind of take that world of Marxism and contort it into this kind of anarchist degrowth, uh, small scale politics. And that doesn't quite fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it it is truly odd. I will just say, but um, Matt, I always appreciate uh, speaking with you. There was, there's a link below for people to read this review. Folks really should. Um, it goes a lot more in depth than we were able to um, in this interview, uh, co-written with Lee Phillips, of course. There's a link to that. We should always pick up Matt's book, Climate Changes, Class War. Um, I know there's a lot going on. Though, is there anything else that you'd like to to plug or direct folks to? Uh, well, Fred Stafford and me had our latest uh, analysis on electricity politics out um, in the second print issue of Damage magazine. It's called The Utility of Utilities, which 
it, it, much of the the villain of the climate left these days are utilities, and uh, mm. uh, they are often quite corrupt and dastardly when it comes to climate change politics. But uh, we try to argue that, um, unfortunately, the critique of utilities has led to a lot of the sort of deregulation and marketization of the electricity sector, and that really kind of revi revisiting this idea that utilities grew out of, which is that electricity is kind of a public utility. It's an essential service. It must be kind of uh, regulated with uh, the public interest in mind. Like these these ideas, we don't want to sort of throw out with the bathwater, right? So, uh, and particularly in this era of decarbonization where we know we're going to have to grow our electricity generation so dramatically to deal with uh, electrifying everything and all this stuff. Like utilities were actually really good at historically at growing the electricity system, building a whole new, a lot of new infrastructure. So anyway, yeah, please subscribe to Damage Magazine. They're doing lots of great stuff and check that out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, please do subscribe to Damage Magazine. And as always, Matt, great talking with you. Hope to have you on again soon. Thanks so much. Just a nice uncontroversial chat there. Nice to uh, talk with Matt uh, once again. I mean, I'm, I, I will admit I'm always amazed at how controversial it seems to be. And to throw a little gasoline on the fire, I have to say, I think a lot of people get really worked up about it. I don't think no. I mean, how many people who are going to get worked up about this conversation think that Marx turned his back on historical materialism um, or secretly became a degrowth uh, communist? Um, I don't know. I think sometimes it's, it's worth sort of understanding where you stand instead of just getting mad. But um, if you want to hear us talk and chat and hang out a little bit more, we're going to be going over to the post game, patreon.com slash left reckoning, get access to that. We'll be taking some questions from the audience. So you want to get in there? I, well, some fun things. Uh, Richard Dawkins is oh, yeah. a Christian now. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, and also, you know these uh, Amazon stores, the fresh and go, fresh whatever. <laughs> the fresh and go, yep. The t I know take fruit mean, yeah. store um, <clears throat> that used AI. Um, AI turns out to be like a guy in India looking at security camera footage to see what you put in your. Oh my god, that's basket, actually really awesome. <laughs> um, it turns out, so uh, yeah, we'll be talking about that. patreoncom slash left reckoning to join yes. us in about twenty minutes. Sounds good, friends. See you there. Nice delay before the uh, videos load up. There we go.